Our scripture this morning is from the book of John, chapter 15. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, and that that fruit will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you this command so that you may love one another. The word of God for us, the people of God. Please be seated. Will you pray with me this morning? Loving God, help us this day and every day to understand what it means to love. You who love us more than we'll ever know. God, may the words of my mouth and those meditations upon each of our hearts and minds be acceptable unto you as we seek to grow in love to you and each other. In Jesus' name, amen. So since Easter, we've been in the Gospel of John, and each week I've said, you know, it's important to understand kind of the story within the story and the context of the things that are going on. And, and each week, Jesus has, has used some sort of a, an illustration or some sort of a farming analogy, to be honest with you, in order for us to kind of see how our world and God's world meet somewhere in place. And you know, Jesus talked about sheep and how we're called to be sheep a few weeks back and how we're to sheep just trust that everything's going to be okay. And then uh, we talked about how Jesus talked about he is the good shepherd, the one who will protect us from those things that, that seek to do harm to us. And then last week we talked about how he said that I'm the vine and you're the branches, that I'm that the, the roots are that would support us and I I'm that which nurtures and sustains you, and you are the ones that go out and branch out into the world to to embody what I mean and what I do for the world around you. And it's important to pay attention to these things because here's the thing. Jesus is teaching his disciples in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John the last things before he's arrested and he goes to the cross. Jesus is honing in on knowing what is coming, and he's saying to his disciples, this is really what you need to get. This is really what you need to understand. This is really what it's all about. And so realizing that all these stories kind of are a confluence that that come together with today's lesson where Jesus tells us, I am giving you these commands so that you love one another. I want to start by asking you the question, how many of you all have had difficulty getting a child or a grandchild or even when you're babysitting to go to bed? It just seems like something that children don't like to do. Either they're afraid they're going to miss out on something or which, you know, they may be, or they just, they just seem to get all stirred up. In our house, you know, our four kids are within three and a half years of each other or so, and, and you talk about two four-year-olds, a five-year-old, and a six-year-old trying to get them in bed at the same time. And, 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 of course, with the dad who was ADD, it was even worse because Amanda would have them all calm, and then I'd come in the house, and we'd wrestle and play at bedtime, and that was not what I was supposed to be doing. And... Then we had, in our first parsonage that we had as a family, was this ranch, brick ranch house. It was all on one level. And 
you, you came in the back door and the kitchen was on the left and then the den was right here in the middle and then there was a long hallway with bedrooms on each side of the hallway and the girls was on the left and the boys was on the right. And, and, and so at bedtime, because we're good parents, we wouldn't make them shut their doors. We just had them cracked just a little bit so that they'd know that things were safe and that they were okay. And, and I'll never forget time and time again, JT was the hardest one to get to bed. He was just a little knucklehead. He was busy. I don't know where he gets it from all the time. And, 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 and so I remember a number of times that, that we'd get all four of them calmed down and, and, and in bed. And, and then Amanda and I would just kind of, at the end of the day, sit down on the sofa and watch TV and just relax. And we'd be sitting there relaxing. And then all of a sudden we'd hear, Mama, JT's doing it again. And we turn and we peek around the corner, and JT would be sitting in his bed, looking around the corner, watching TV. It was unfair to everybody else. And it kind of reminds me of a story about another kid that I was told a number of years ago that was having difficulty going to bed. It was a, a little boy, and his, his parents had given him his bath, and they had read him a story, and he'd had water, and he'd gone to the restroom and everything else, and he lays down in his bed, and, and he's busy in his bed, and he lays down, and his parents kind of leave the room, and a couple of minutes later, he says, Mama, there's a monster under the bed. So the mom comes in the room, and she pulls him out of the bed, and she shines a little flashlight under the bed, she says, see, there's nothing under the bed, and so puts him back up in the bed and tucks him in tightly, and, and then walks back out of the room, and a little while later, Daddy? There's a, something in the closet. So the dad comes in the room and gets him out of bed and walks over to the closet and shows him everything's safe and nothing's in the closet going to get him or anything else. And so they put him back in bed and then he says, Mama, read me a story. And the mom comes in and she says, I'm not reading you a story. It's bedtime. You need to go to bed. So she walks out of the room and, and, and then he says, Daddy, I got to go potty. And the dad comes in the room, he's like, you've been potty, you need to go to bed. Don't do this again, I'm not coming back. They leave, leave they, they leave, and, the, and just a couple minutes later, the little boy says, but I don't want to be alone. And so they thought, we'll change the way we do things, we'll, we'll add theology to it, we'll put God in it, and maybe that'll help. And so they yell back to him, listen, Jesus is with you, you'll be fine. And the little boy was quiet. But then a few moments later, this little boy says, I know, but I need somebody with skin on. I think today's lesson teaches us that Jesus is skin on for us. That Jesus is God enfleshed for us. That we get to know God because God is with us. In our lesson today, God reminds us in so many ways that Jesus put skin on, and flesh and blood on for us, and, and then he sends us out to be his presence for the world. In our lesson today, if you don't get anything, understand that Jesus clearly reminds not only his disciples but us that everything begins and ends with love. All of creation was created because love is what God is and what God does. And, and when creation and humankind fell aside and chose to do our own thing, out of God's love, Jesus emptied himself and came and died in order to fix the things that we had done wrong. And in our day-to-day -day lives, the Holy Spirit continues to support and nurture and care for us because God loves us. Now, our lesson for today, I think that Jesus is laying the framework for how to deal with the challenges that the disciples are going to face, what is about to come with his arrest and his crucifixion and the diaspora and separation and, and, and all the worries and concerns that are to come. And so Jesus, I believe in our lesson today, is telling them three things just really quickly. The first one is this. He's telling them, listen up, pay attention. I chose every single one of you for a reason and for a purpose. And that reason is simply to embody my love in the world. Love one another. 
Another thing that he says in the lesson that's important for us to understand is as Jesus says to his disciples, I have called you my friends. I no longer call you servants because the servants don't know what the master's doing, but I have called you my friends. I think the purpose therein is a reminder for us that, that friendship is how we best understand relationships with the world. If we see people as friends, we see them as equal. We see them as worthy of relationship and deepening an understanding of who we are. We celebrate who they are. And so no longer are we called servants, but friends. And we understand that through loving relationships and friendships. And then the last thing Jesus is laying this foundation for how to deal with the challenges to come is he tells the disciples, you are called to go and bear fruit and fruit that will last. And you're going to do it by the way in which you love one another. You know, if you didn't get it in this passage, the focused word is love, right? As a matter of fact, nine times in this lesson alone is the term love used. It says, as God has loved you, so I love you. I have loved you because abide in my love. Again, he says, abide in my love. Abide in God's love and love one another like I have loved you. No greater love have a man than be willing to lay down life for his friends. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Again, I believe that Jesus is reminding us that everything in our faith is all compiled together into this one thing. Love and learning how to love. Interesting that in the context of the cross that we're reminded of the cost that Jesus gave was to share God's love with all of humankind. To share God's love through giving His life. Now when I read a text and prepare for a sermon, what I do is, is I read it and then I kind of think about it and pray about it and jot some notes down and then do a little search on the internet and everything else. And and it's interesting to me that different things at different times, even preach sermons, things that I've preached on before, kind of jump out of nowhere. And it, it's kind of fun because I get a deep, more in-depth Bible study. And this week, as I read, there were like three words that just popped out to me, three words that are words of action and words of, words of inspiration, and I think even words of hope for us as we deal with our lives and living our lives in a world that seems so tragically fractured at times. Those three words are this, called and, and chosen and appointed. If you remember the text, they were inherently there in the beginning and through the end. And, and the first one is this. Jesus said in, in um, verse 16, 15, I'm sorry, I have called you. Now, began, the great thing about sermon research is, is you begin to, to kind of, when you hear a word that pops up, you begin to, to search and figure out what that means and, and, and begin to ask, what does it mean to be called? Right now, nowadays we hear that somebody called me, and we basically think, "Well, what did they have to say? What do they want?" And the term "calling" is an even more in-depth thing. It's a more, more has more sense of purpose to it. Let me give you an analogy that seems to work for me. When I was a kid growing up, uh, our first house in Thomasville that my parents built, we had a little courtyard next to the side entrance, which is really the entrance where all the friends come in anyway. Right. And my dad had a four-by-four four put in the ground in concrete, and then at the top of it, he had a bell installed with a string on it. And when that bell rang, you were called. That bell meant something with a purpose. That bell meant, it's dinner time, come home. That bell meant, it's bedtime, get here quickly. That bell meant, mama needs to see you. When Jesus says, I have called you, it's not just simply I have reached out, but I want you to be here with me so that I can show you what it means to embody love. A calling is more than just being brought to the dinner table. It's a sense of giving a purpose and us responding to that purpose by living our lives in ways that embody God's love. So that's the first thing is that we're called. The second thing is, is that we're chosen. Jesus said in verse 16, you did not choose me, I chose you. 
And again, it begs me to ask the question, what does it mean to be chosen? And as I first thought about being chosen, it took me back to those terrible times of playgrounds in elementary school, right? I was never chosen for Red Rover, Red Rover, because I was a little skinny guy that couldn't break through the arms. I was the one that never got chosen for the spelling bee because I couldn't even spell my name right. And it gave me that sense of fear and that sense of, oh my gosh, if, if God, it says, Jesus said, you didn't choose me, choose me, I chose you. And those are words rather than a fear, but words of comfort and strength. Because being chosen is more than just being made a part of the team. It means that there's hope for you and for me. Because God sees value in our lives. And that we can make a difference for the rest of the world. So Jesus calls us, Jesus chooses us, and lastly, Jesus said, I have appointed you to go and bear fruit. You know, the word appointment means that there's a sense, a reason, there's an end game. We go to appointments because there's a purpose behind it, right? An appointment with a doctor is to get information or to be taken care of. An appointment with somebody means that we have a purpose in our lives. And, and when Jesus says, I have appointed you to go and bear fruit, it means that he has a deeper sense of calling on us, that he hasn't just called us, but he is now sending us forth to do something. And I believe the rubber hits the road in faith when we're appointed, when we're sent out to value others like God values us. In our lesson today, I believe that God has been reminding us that we're all called and we're all chosen and we're all appointed to go out into the world. And let's be honest, it's a world that desperately needs to know about God's love. Even the Beatles got it right when they said, all you need is love. All you need is love. You know, a number of years ago, a friend of mine and I were going to the funeral for the father of another friend of ours and. And it was when we were early on in our seminary careers. And, and so we went to the funeral, and, and we were there to support our friend, and we got in the car to drive home. And this funeral was not an easy trip from Durham. It was like four hours up into the mountains in the middle of nowhere. And so when we got in the car, we turned on the radio. Just, we wanted to listen to something on the way home, and we couldn't find anything on the radio because it was that far into the woods that all there was was AM radio station that came up, and it was... It was some Christian radio, Christian radio station, and so this preacher was preaching, and so we're like, well, we might as well just listen, you know, and of course, as the preacher began to preach, being the, the brilliant seminarians that we are, we began to critique the sermon of how well, I would have chosen to say it differently than this, and I would have done this, and I would have done this better, and, and, and you know, and as we listened, the preacher, as the preacher got more amped up and more excited about their sermon, the preacher kept stopping and saying, but people, you got to understand, all we got to do is love each another. All we got to do is love each another. And again and again, the preacher said it. And finally, I looked at my friend and I said, what a fool. Each another is not a word. So then we begin to critique, yeah, each and other isn't a word, it's each other. Why are they seeing each and other? And, and we're sitting there, and all of a sudden we kind of get tired of critiquing, and we, we turn off the radio, and we're driving down the road, and, and we're sitting there. And then, as God sometimes tends to do, God decides to show up. And I said, you know, maybe we're wrong, and maybe they're right. Maybe each another is a word. My friend and I began to talk about how do we focus on the word or the message that's found therein? When Jesus calls us to love one another, he embodies what love means. And he's telling us that this world that seems to be tragic and broken and angry and hurting and, and pulling people apart. Our job is to pull it back together by loving each another. Even in times that are difficult in our community or even within the framework of the church, maybe God's just simply calling us to love 
each another. So brothers and sisters in Christ, it's my hope for you as it is for me that more than anything else, as we move forward in the days to come, we can just do one thing and try to get it right. Love each another. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.